Because Mr. Jansen, the bus driver, was always looking out for him, Reed didn't miss the bus. He made a total fool of himself, waving his arms around and shouting as Mr. Jansen started to pull away from the curb, but he got the driver's attention. Mr. Jansen stopped the bus a few feet from the curb and opened the bus's doors. The driver of one of the buses further down the row behind Reed's bus honked. Stumbling up the stairs onto the bus, Reed gasped, thanks to Mrs. Mr. Gan- Ganson, <laughs> who shook his grey head head and winked at Reed. Cutting it close, my boy, cutting it close. Reed sucked in some air. Sorry. Life happens, Mr. Jansen said. We adjust. He smiled at Reed. Take your seat. Reed scanned the interior of the bus. One of the cheerleaders gave him a disgusted look. Reed ignored her and looked for Shaddy and Prickle. He knew they'd be at the back of the bus, and he knew they'd saved him a seat. Keeping his gaze on his feet and the aisles scuffed rubber flooring, Reed hurried to his friends. He slid in next to Pickle. As soon as Reed's butt hit the hard maroon vinyl seat, Mr. Jansen released the brakes. The bus hissed, lurched, and rumbled away from the school. Reed looked at Pickle's nose. It was hard not to, red and swollen, smeared with blood. Pickle's nose was more prominent than ever, and now he had little white tissues, tissue rolls sticking out of each nostril. Given that his nose was beaky, Pickle looked like a big bird sucking up white worms. Does it hurt? Reed asked. Pickle, as usual, was doing some kind of numbers puzzle. He glanced up at Reed. Huh? Reed pointed at his nose. Pickle made a funny cross-eyed face in an attempt to look at his injured beak. Reed suppressed a smile. Pickle shrugged. Yeah, not the first time though. I can ignore it. Sorry. Why? What did you do? Nothing. Pickle returned to his puzzle. Reed glanced at Shelley. She was also reading, as usual. Um, the bus smelled like diesel exhaust, sweat, peanuts, and bubble gum. Its engine sounded like the contented snore of a sleep- sleeping dragon. Uh, the sound helped tension and adrenaline drain from Reed's system. The bus gained speed as it turned out of the school's driveway onto the road. Reed looked out the window. The high school was tucked into the back of an older neighbourhood, so the first few blocks after they left the school were full of big trees and pretty green lawns. Reed usually liked looking at all that greenery. He would stare at the lawns with envy. His front yard was mostly dirt. Today, Reed wasn't really seeing anything he was looking at. He was back in the robotics classroom with Julius. His mind focused on Julius locked into his exoskeleton, Julius's face nearly purple with rage. In the Dark Ages, Shelley said, Harsh torture was commonly used to punish those who broke the law. Reed flinched. What? He turned to stare at Shelley. As always, she sat in the seat behind Pickle and Reed. Her massive backpack and extra book bag took up the rest of the seat. Did she know what he'd done? Her attention on her book, Shelley continued. When someone violated civil war, torture would be done in the town square. Public display of the consequences for lawlessness was thought to be a deterrent. Oh, she was reading. Of course she was. She loved to share what she was learning, and she often read it aloud on the bus, and at home, and at lunch, and uh, in the hallways, and at school. She read pretty much everywhere. Today, she was reading her history homework. Shelley was in AP World History because she'd read so many history books outside of school that she was beyond the normal history curriculum. She wasn't just a a science geek. She was an information geek. Reed relaxed his shoulders and returned his attention to the window. When it left behind the neighbourhood, the the bus route ran along a main drag lined with strip malls and car dealerships. Reed liked this stretch too because he enjoyed looking at the cars. He liked to imagine himself driving them and he picked a different make and model every day. Concentrating, he put himself at the wheel of a new bright yellow Mustang. Shelley's voice, however, ruined his fantasy. Torturers were very creative in the Middle Ages, Shelley read. They came up with truly morbid ways of inflicting excruciating pain. The Judas Cradle, for example, impaled a seated victim for several days, with blood-curdling names like the Breast Ripper and the Pair of Anguish. Medieval torture devices were a testament to human ingenuity. Torture was was what I did to Julius torture? Reed's chest tightened. Yeah, it probably was. Being stuck 
was at least a mild form of torture, especially in an exoskeleton with no way to move or eat or drink or get to the bathroom. It wasn't the Judas Cradle, but it wasn't nice either. After the Mauls and Carlots, their bus route wound uh, through a uh, wound, sorry, through an industrial park, and then it passed a farm before turning into a newer subdivision. Most of the bus's stops were in this subdivision, which was stuffed full of houses that, though good size, mostly looked alike. We didn't care about the houses, so he stopped registering individual things. Now he just saw blurs of colour and Julia stuck in that metal framework. Reed's dad, who did the best he could to be a single dad to Reed and his sister Alexa, was fond of saying that you couldn't solve a problem at the level of the problem. Reed wasn't a genius like his friends, but he was smart enough to know that meant lowering himself to the level of Julius's meanness wasn't the way to handle the jerk. But still, after what Julius did to Pickle, wasn't that justification enough to lock Julius in the, into the exoskeleton he was so proud of? And what about what Julius had said to Reed, about locking Reed in, into the exoskeleton? Didn't Julius deserve to get a taste of his own medicine? Reed started to unwind his muscles again. Yeah, what he did wasn't so bad. It was justice. The bus went through a pothole, and everyone popped off and everyone popped up off their seats for a nanosecond. When they all landed again, Shelley poked Reed's shoulder. He turned to look at her. Listen to this, she said. You won't believe it. What? Pickle said nothing. He kept inking in the answers to his puzzle. One of the most commonly used forms of torture was called the wheel, Shelley read from her thick, musty-smelling book. Those condemned to being constrained in this way had prolonged torture ahead of them. They were held in place, unable to free themselves. Reed stared at Shelley. What was she doing? Was she messing with him? Held in place, unable to free themselves. It sounded like she was talking about Julius. Maybe she knew what he'd done after all. But how? It was, some kind, it was sometimes called the breaking wheel, Shelley read on. Reed blew out air. No. She didn't know that, but she didn't know what she, he'd done. It was just a coincidence that she was reading about torture devices. They called it that, she continued, because it was used to crush the bones of the condemned. Ooh, huh? Shelley looked at Reed with wide eyes. Then she returned her gaze to the book and read on. The device was designed for torture lasting over multiple days. The wheel was made up of many radial spokes, and the person subjected to it was tied to the whole wheel before a club or Cudgel, Cudgel was used to beat their limbs. This process reduced the human being into a mutilated bag of bones, sorry, what one onlooker described as a writhing, moaning monster with bloody tentacles. That's gross, Pickle said, without looking up from his puzzle. Totally, Reed said. He tried not to think about what Julius was experiencing now. But hey, at least Julius wasn't tied to a medieval torture device, right? Julius was, rest uh, was restrained, and as time passed, he'd be uncomfortable. But he wasn't in any pain. No one was standing over him, beating him with a cudgel or whatever that was. He was just trapped. Shelley continued to read about medieval torture, but Reed tuned her out. He turned back toward the window. The bus was stopped at a corner, and he watched her mum holding hands with a little balloon with a little kid who held a red balloon, sorry. The balloon bobbed in the air, following the little kid's movements because it was tied to the kid's wrist. Reed thought about Julius's big wrists. Maybe he should go back to the school and unlock the exoskeleton after their study session this evening. A few hours would be enough to punish Julius for his, ha uh, for his nattiness. That way, Julius would learn his lesson, but Reed wouldn't stoop to the level of torture. Yeah, that's what Reed would do. Except, how would he get away from Julius before Julius tried to kill him? Reed chewed on his lower lip. He sat up straight and smiled. He knew what he could do. He'd unlock just one of Julius's hands and then jump back and run before Julius could grab him. Julius, stiff from his confinement, would take at least half a minute to unlock his other wrist and his ankles, and in that time, Reed could get far enough away to hide. Once Julius was done, Reed could go home. And after that? Well, he'd deal with that when the time came. But until then, he was going to have some good food at the Girard's house and hang out with his friends. He was going to put Julius out of his mind and enjoy the rest of his free time that day. He deserved it, just like Julius deserved what was happening to him. Reed loved his dad, 
and he knew his dad did everything he could to give Reed and Alexa a good home. But his dad was, well, his dad. He knew nothing about what a good home was. He couldn't cook. He couldn't clean. He thought decoration was a calendar with fish photos on it and a few sports team schedules. When Reed was home, he never really felt at home, not like he did here at the Gerard house. Reed sprawled on a thick, soft grey rug in front of a stone hearth. A low-burning fire sputtered on the grate. T oh, God. <laughs> Tallies. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to call them Tallies, whatever. Uh, exhausted from a rousing game of chase the tennis ball, was now stretched out on the cool tiles of the nearby entryway, adding his satisfied snores to the flame's staccato popping. The sounds were both rhythmic and soothing. Reed's belly was full of spicy chicken wings, jalapeno poppers, potato skins, homemade pot pie, and chocolate cookies. He was so relaxed he wished he could take a nap. You kids have everything you need before I head to my class? Mrs. Gerard asked. She stood in the archway between the family room and the entryway, tugging on a floppy yellow rain hat. Reed turned and looked over his shoulder, out through the French doors to the Gerard's heavy treed backyard. Yep, it was raining. A steady but light spring rain. The drops looked shiny and pink in the twilight. Reed craned his neck to see the western horizon. He liked looking at the sun when it was getting ready to slide into nighttime. Tonight the sun was a fuzzy bright orange tinged with purple. He looked back at Mrs. Gerard. Thanks for the snacks and for the dinner too. Mrs. Gerard smiled and tucked her shoulder length dark hair under the rain hat. She shrugged her short plump body into her slicker and said, you're welcome as always Reed, we love having you here. She snapped her slicker closed and looked at her own kids who were all oblivious of her impending departure. Shelley, reclining on an overstuffed navy blue sofa, had her nose buried in the same thick history book she'd been reading on the bus. Pickle sat cross-legged in his dad's blue tweed recliner, bending so low over his own book it looked like he was trying to dive into it. Reed couldn't see what Pickle was reading. The third Gerard kid, six-year-old Ori, had been playing a video game but now he was picking up the remote for Pickle's robot skeleton. <clears throat> Kids, Mrs. Gerard yelled. All three of her children looked up. Mrs. Gerard shook her head and smiled. I'm leaving. You kids behave. And Pickle, I that nose again in an hour or so. Huh? Pickle said. Mrs. Gerard shook her head. I'll remind him, Reed said. Pickle's nose was looking much better. Predictably, Mrs. Gerard had matter-of-factly treated uh, Pickle's nose the second they got home. Ex examining it, she'd declared it bruised, not broken, and she'd cleaned it up, applied some kind of herbal cream, and then given Pickle an ice pack to balance on his face. Pickle resided that, because he couldn't eat or read with the pack on his nose, but he didn't have to leave it on for long. Soon, he was eating snacks along with everyone else, and he declared the double chocolate chip cookies Mrs. Gerard brought out after dinner healing cookies because his nose stopped hurting after he ate them. Now, after studying her beaky son for a second, Mrs. Gerard looked at Reed. What would we do without you, Reed? Mrs. Gerard smiled at him and then turned back to her kids. Bye, kids. Love you, mum, Shelley said. Bye, Pickle and Ori said in unison. Thanks again, Mrs. Gerard. Bye. Reed said, bye all, Mrs. Gerard said, come on Tallies. <laughs> Tallies was already on his feet, standing next to Mrs. Gerard's legs. His tail whipped so fast it was slapping her in the thigh. Mrs. Gerard's class was his class too. He was learning to be a therapy dog. Mrs. Gerard, though not the source of her children's brilliance, was no brain slouch. She went to all sorts of classes. She seemed to have a lot of interests and she always joined in the conversations when her kids were babbling on about their homework or projects. But the Gerard brains come mostly from Mr. Gerard. He was a retired electrical engineer who now did consulting for big companies. He traveled a lot and he was gone now. But when he was here, he was a hands-on dad. He was cool. Shelley and Pickle had returned to their books before the front door shut behind Mrs. Gerard. Ori 
press the button on the remote control and Pickle's robot skeleton stood up and slid forward a few inches. Ori's eyes lit up. Ori was a conglomeration, conglomeration of his siblings, which made him not as cute as Shelly, but much cuter than Pickle. His face was still round and a little pudgy. Ori had Shelly's large eyes and long lashes and full mouth, and he had his brother's nose. On Ori, the big nose was more amusing than ugly. He looked a little like a baby bird. Six-year-olds could rock a look like that. Ori wouldn't have to worry about looks for a while. Ori bent over the remote, so intent on it, he nearly touched it with his long nose. The little robot skeleton scooted to forward some more. Ori laughed. Reed glanced at Pickle. Pickle either didn't know his brother was playing with his project or he didn't care. Probably if Ori damaged the thing in any way, Pickle could easily fix it. Reed looked at his own pathetic project. He was supposed to be working on it, and he hadn't and he had been sort of on and off all, all afternoon. Um sorry. He hadn't made much progress though. Reed had chosen an electric motor as his actuator because his dad knew how to build a motor and was excited to help him. That part of the project, along with connecting the battery-powered motor to the exoskeleton circuitry, had gone okay. The problem Reed had now was with the skeleton structure. As always, he couldn't visualise how to construct the form. Every time he attached a new metal component to the skeleton, he ended up with something that stuck out at an unnatural angle. And when he turned to make it fit, the joint didn't work properly. Right now, his exoskeleton looked mangled and backwards. This wasn't good. Reed sighed and gazed around the cosy room. Even though the Gerard family room was big and had high ceilings, it was warm and inviting, kind of like a cocoon. Filled with comfortable, soft furniture, a couple tables, multiple shelves, stuff with books and games, colourful art, a tidy play area for Ori, a big microfiber covered bed for tallies, the fireplace, and a huge TV for movie night and video games. The room was perfect for hanging out. It wasn't so bad for doing homework either. You might as well be comfortable while you were doing something you didn't want to do. The week before, the family room got an addition that intrigued Reed. It was a miniature house, a replica of the Girard home. Standing about three feet tall and stretching four, re four feet wide, the house required the removal of one ottoman from the room. But otherwise, it fit in just fine. Mr. Girard built the house for Shelley, and she was decorating it to look exactly like the family's real house. Do you want me to help you with that? Pickle asked. Huh? Reed looked over at his friend. Pickle marked his book which Reed could now see was on advanced engineering mathematics. You sighed, Pickle said, and your exoskeleton looks like it's being built by a blind man without opposable thumbs. I wondered if you wanted some help. Reed threw a gear at Pickle. Pickle didn't mean to be mean, but he was brilliant. He was just brilliant in his own matter of fact kind of way. That was why he was okay to hang out with, even though he was super smart. Pickle never made Reed feel dumb. Even when he made a comment like that one. Reed knew Pickle wasn't making fun of him. Pickle was just making an observation. I'll model through, thank you. You might try angling the joints so the left and the right limbs move in the same or at least similar ways. Unless you're building an alien uh, exoskeleton. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Obvious, Reed said. He made a face. Maybe I am building an alien exoskeleton. Cool. Pickle shrugged and returned to his book. Shelley looked up from hers. What? Reed laughed. My exoskeleton is an alien. Shelley rolled her eyes and returned to reading. Ori laughed. Reed turned to see if the kid was laughing at Reed. He wasn't. What? <laughs> you put Reed in the same sentence. He was fully focused on the robot's remote. Pickle's robotic skeleton ploughed into the hearth with a loud crunch. Pickle didn't look up from his book. Ori, tried, or, Ori backed up the seven-inch skeleton and started spinning it in a circle. Reed began to reconsider Pickle's offer. He was pretty sure Pickle had built his little robotic skeleton in a day. Maybe he could help Reed salvage his project. Seriously, look at the thing move, Reed thought. He shook his head at the little robotic skeleton as it whipped in tight circles. He sucked in his breath and sat up. How could he have forgotten what happened in class today? Well, to be fair, a lot had happened since class. The confrontation with Julius, along with Reed's resulting uncharacteristic burst of nerd, of nerd, of nerve, 
had pretty much acted like a brain wipe of the rest of the day. All Reed could think about was Julius locked in his exoskeleton. But now he remembered. Julius all Julius had been complaining that Pickle's remote was affecting Julius's exoskeleton, and Julius was now locked into that metal frame, his body inextricably linked <laughs> with its structure and therefore inextricably linked with its movement. What if it had crashed into something the way Pickle's robot had just crashed into the hearth? What if it was spinning in circles right now? Hey, Pickle. Reed kept his gaze on the gyrating mini metal skeleton. Huh? Pickle looked up at Reed. That thing, Reed pointed at the remote in Ori's small hands, doesn't have much of a range, right? Pickle sniffed. It's a pretty great range actually. I designed the remote to function through walls. That's why I combined IR and RF. So if it was controlling um, something uh, outside the house, how far would its range be? Reed asked. Pickle frowned. You mean if the skeleton was outside and Ori was inside? Reed nodded. Yeah, sure that's what you meant. He didn't mean if the remote was controlling Julius's exoskeleton. No, he didn't mean that at all. Pickle tilted his head and thought about it. It might reach to a few feet outside the house, maybe. Honestly, I've never checked. It probably doesn't reach beyond the house. The outer walls would be thicker than the inside walls. More interference. Oh, Reed said attempting to sound uninterested even though he had asked the question. Okay. Reed tugged at his t-shirt which was sticking to his suddenly sweaty skin. He suppressed a sigh of relief. Pickle leaned forward. Why'd you ask? Ori now had the robotic skeleton racing through the room in dizzying, in dizzying serpentine roots around furniture. Reed tried not to imagine Julius zipping around the robotics classroom in a similar fashion. If he was doing if he was doing in his suit what Pickle's robot was doing here, Julius would be bashed into walls and furniture. He'd be at least badly bruised. More likely he'd have broken bones. Oh man, Reed thought. I must be truly torturing Julius. Reed? Reed looked at Pickle. He was suddenly elated that his friend's genius didn't extend to reading minds, and he was also glad that Pickle also sucked at deciphering facial expressions, body language, and other social cues. Reed was sure his deliberately blank face wasn't as effective as he wanted it to be. He was trying for innocent, but he had a feeling he looked like Tally's did when when the dog stole, stole a cookie and was pretending and was trying to pretend he didn't. Oh, I was just curious, Reed said. It's impressive, that's all. Pickle raised a thick black eyebrow. Okay. Pickle might not have been able to read interpersonal visual cues, but his brain was like an audio recorder. He remembered everything he'd ever read or heard. He was now going through that database and contrasting everything Reed had ever said to him before today with what Reed had just said. Reed had never before told Pickle that he'd, something he'd done was impressive, he was so used to Pickle outperforming everyone around him that praising Pickle for doing something well was sort of like praising him for breathing. Pickle definitely found Reed's last comment strange. Pickle opened his mouth as if he was going to ask a question, but Ori saved Reed. He ploughed Pickle's exoskeleton into the side of Shelley's miniature house. The metal hit the wood, siding with a thud, and Shelley sat up on the sofa. She stuck a book, a, a bookmark, a bookmark in her book, clearly ready to confront her little brother. Before she could do or say anything, though, Ori backed up the uh, robotic skeleton and ran it forward again. He giggled and repeated the action, bumping the little robot into the miniature house over and over. Shelley jumped up. "Hey, Ori, stop it! He's not going to hurt it," Pickle said. "Let him play with it." "I'm not worried about your robot," Shelley said. "He's not going to hurt my house." He's going to mess up my project. Shelley started toward Ori, who giggled and darted away from her. Shelley chased Ori, but he easily stayed away uh, ahead of her. He continued to play with the remote at the same time, so the little robot kept butting at the house. Ori, you little twerp, Shelley said. I'm going to break our sibling vinculum if you don't cut that out. Vinculum was one of the daily words from the previous week. It meant bond. That one stuck in Reed's head because he thought, when Shelley defined the word, 
that he'd like a deeper vin vinculum with her. <laughs> Ori, if you ruin my project... What project? Reed asked. He didn't care. He was trying to distract himself from thoughts about Julius, who, if he was being controlled by Pickle's remote, was probably being slammed into a wall in the classroom right now. Or what if he was being slammed into something sharp, like one of Mrs. Billings' robot's arms? Could Julius get impaled? It's a project for psychology class about family dynamics, Shelley said, panting and lunging for her little brother. Seriously, Shell, it's okay, Pickle said. The robot isn't going to hurt the house. It doesn't have any sharp edges. Pickle set aside his book and scrambled out of his dad's chair. He went over to where the robot was attacking the house over and over, leaning forward and pointing at the tiny rough pieces of overlapping wood that looked like the grey shingled slight siding on the real house. He said, see, not a scratch. Shelley stopped pursuing Ori. She came back to the miniature house, knelt down and examined it. Oh, she shrugged and returned to the sofa. Okay. She picked up her book and presumably returned to medieval torture. Torture. What if Julius was being tortured right now? He had to be battered pretty badly if he'd been forced to do everything Pickle's robot was doing. Pickle sat down on the floor in front of Shelley's house. He reached out and snatched up his robot. Ori, to assist for a second. Uh, Ori shoved out his lower lip. But I wanna... He began to whine. I'm not going to take it away from you, Pickle assured his brother. I'm going to make it more fun. Pickle held up his metal skeleton, which was still whirring in an effort to respond to the remote's commands. Ori's lower lip returned to its normal position. He stopped playing with the remote and his face brightened. Yeah? What are you going to do? He came over and sat down next to Pickle. I've got something cool to show you, Pickle said. It's something else you can do with this. Pickle put down the robot. He nudged Ori. So watch this, Pickle whispered. Pickle flipped a switch on the little robot. Now try it, Pickle said to Ori. Ori grinned and pushed a button on the remote. The robot stood on its blockish head. What did you just do? Reed asked Pickle. Oh, I just turned off the joint constraints, so now my robot can go against logical joint directions too. Like yours, only on purpose. <laughs> Ori gleefully pushed buttons and toggled the joystick on the remote, and the little robot flipped off his head and turned into a metal contort it started crawling across the floor like an octopus, its joints warping into impossible pretzel-like shapes. Looking at once like it was turning itself inside out and like it was expanding and contradicting, uh, sorry, and contracting the way a beating heart did, the robot became so fluid it resembled a snake. Ori directed the robot into the entry area and it clicked and clacked over the slate as it in, uh, undulated across the floor. Reed stared at it, his throat constricting. In his head, inside of the sound of the robot's metal limbs contacting on the uh, hard floor, Reed could hear the snaps and pops of breaking bones. Julius's breaking bones. The sounds were in his head, weren't they? He was imagining it and not hearing it, right? No, of course he wasn't hearing it. How could he hear it? Pickle said the remote's range wouldn't reach much beyond the Girard's house. And even if it was happening, Reed wouldn't be able to hear it. His ears weren't superhuman. They were miles from the school. If his mind was telling him he could hear Julius's bones break, his mind was lying. Reed's fears were so stupid. He couldn't believe his mind was coming up with this stuff. It was asinine. <laughs> there is no way Pickle's remote could have any impact on Julius's framework. Therefore, it was having no impact on Julius. So why did Reed feel so rotten? Why was his stomach in his throat? Why did he feel like he might throw up all over the great food he'd eaten? Did he intuitively know something? Was his intuition right and his logic wrong? Reed took a deep breath and looked at his exoskeleton. Focus, he told himself. Stop imagining all that stupid stuff. Reed leaned over his project. He tried to concentrate on his exoskeleton joints, but he couldn't. Ori was having just too much fun with Pickle's robot. Now that the boy could make the thing writhe all over the place, he was practically dancing with glee. Pickle returned to his dad's easy chair and picked up his book. Shelley was still lost in their own reading. 
Ori started making the robot assault Shelley's house again. Shelley glanced up, but apparently comforted by Pickle's assurances, she placidly returned to her book. Reed scrambled off the floor. He'd had enough. I'll be back, he said. I have to do something. Ori ignored him, continuing to aim the robot at the side of Shelley's house. Pickle looked up from his book. Where are you going? I have to do something, Reed repeated. What? Pickle asked. What could Reed say? He couldn't say, I just have to go to the school and free Julius, even though that was exactly what he had to do. He had to run the three blocks to his house, get his bike and pedal back to the school. Then he had to get in the locked school without setting off an alarm. Thankfully, he'd overheard a senior talking about a basement door that wasn't wired into the school's security system and a key ring the janitor kept in a fake rock. Then he had to go through the darkened school without wetting his pants like a scared little kid. And then he had to unlock Julius and run for his life. No, wait, should he check on Julius before running? What if his worst fears were true? If Julius was badly injured, wouldn't Reed have to call an ambulance? He almost groaned out loud, but he stopped himself. And what if Julius was dead? Reed? Reed blinked when he realised Pickle had said his name. What? He said. You said you had to do something. Pickle reminded him. I asked what you had to do. Then your brain took a vacation and you turned into a weird statue. Statue? Reed was stalling. He tried to think of a reasonable story. What could he have to do right now, other than go save Julius from a modern day version of the wheel? Shelley? Pickle said. I think something's wrong with Reed. Shelley looked up from her book. Of course something's wrong with Reed, she said. He doesn't engage in enough intellection, and he lacks the appropriate night... Ni <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Shelley, why do you have to do me dirty like this? The appropriate nicest... Nisus, when it comes to schoolwork. Oh snap, Reed thought. Even in his agitated state, he recognised that Shelley had just used two words of the day. However, he was far too distracted to care about what they meant. I'm not talking about Reed's commonplace imperfections, Pickle said. I'm referring to the fact that he's currently making no sense and his body keeps forgetting how to remain animated. Well, see, that's what I like about Reed, Shelley said. Reed perked up, momentarily forgetting everything, but finding out that Shelley liked about him. What's that? Pickle asked. Reed was relieved. He didn't have to be the one who asked. He rarely makes sense. I like that. It gives me a challenge and keeps me interested. Reed couldn't stop himself. He grinned like a maniac. Thankfully, no one was looking at him. Pickle and Shelley were looking at each other. Ori's gaze was on the little robot, whose metal limbs were now so distorted they looked elastic. I can see your point, Pickle said to Shelley, but my original question remains. Pickle returned his attention to Reed. What do you have to do? Before Reed could come up with something lame, the little robot hit the side of the miniature house again, and when it did, something large hit the outside of the Girard's house. Shelley looked at the French doors, then put her attention back on her book. Wind must have come up. We probably lost another branch of the big fir tree, Pickle said. Re looked at the window. In the short time since Mrs. Gerard had left, night had slipped in around the house. Now blackness clung to the windows like a fungus. Reed couldn't see anything in the framed glass of the French doors except the reflection of the room he was in. In that reflection, he watched Ori aim the robot at the house again. He watched it hit the miniature house. In the same instant, something hit the side of the house again with a reverberating thump. Reed tensed. He looked at his friends. Neither Pickle nor Shelley reacted to the latest sound. They were apparently satisfied with the wind and fallen branch explanation for the second thump, or since they were reading again, they may not have even heard it. Well, Reed heard it, and the wind explanation didn't cut it. He was listening intently now, and even though he'd heard those impacts against the house, what he didn't hear was wind strong enough to blow a branch at the house that could make noise. He should have been hearing a whistling, whooshing sound if the wind was blowing that hard, and except for the continued crackle in the fireplace and the sound of the robot hitting Shelley's little house, the only other little things Reed could hear were the impacts on the side of the house every time the robotic skeleton hit the model house. What if Julius was out there? What if he truly had been manipulated by Pickle's remote um, all this time? By now, what condition would Julius be in? 
What Reed lacked in intellection, he made up for it in imagination. He could easily envision a body covered in swelling, blackened contusions. He could see limbs as limp, as rubber with bone fragments poking through the skin. He could see a battered face, a bleeding skull, and a spine warped into something sickeningly abnormal. If in his endoskeleton Julius had been spun, then bashed into things over and over, and if he'd been twisted and contorted the way Pickle's robot had been, would Julius even be human anymore? He'd be a mutilated mess of broken bones and torn flesh. What was it Shelley's history book had said about the victims of the wheel? A victim of the wheel ended up looking like a moaning monster with bloody tentacles. Yep, that's what Julius would have become if everything Ori had done to Pickle's robot had also been done to Julius's ex exoskeleton. Ori rammed the churning robot into the side of the miniature house again. And again, outside, something hit the real house with similar force.